I wanted to come on here and clarify some thoughts about some of the posts I've been making in regards to women, the place of women, the position of women, women in ministry, women preachers, women teachers, things like that. You know, those trigger subjects that nobody likes to talk about, or maybe people do like to talk about them just to stir up a hornet's nest, so to speak. This all began due to a poster that I saw on Facebook that was posted by a good friend and brother of mine, Brother Paul Neeson, whom I love dearly and consider a brother in the Messiah. And then the comments started rolling on that particular thread. Because the poster was giving somebody's understanding of the characteristics of a righteous woman in the Bible. The poster listed, I think, six characteristics. I think the first one was that a woman should be quiet. Then it said a woman should be a keeper of the home, doing dishes, uh, folding the laundry, ironing, things like that. I don't know who decided that those things are only for women to do. The poster went on to say something about uh, women being modest, women being uh, caretakers of children. Um, it said women should be silent in church. Um, and there might have been one or two more things that were mentioned on the poster. I made a comment, I think, on Brother Paul's thread that I didn't believe that any man who held up that poster at a rally or a march or what have you was a good student of the Bible. I stand by that claim. It's not because I didn't think there was anything true on the poster. For example, I do believe that women should be modest, modest in their speech, modest in their possessions, and modest in their dress. The problem I had with the poster is that there were some half-truths on there, and oftentimes half-truths lead to falsehoods. My guess is, though, the person who made the poster has had some bad experiences with some unrighteous women, and their intention is for a woman, if they want to marry me, the man is saying, sit down, shut up, don't ever say anything, I'm your head, you have to do what I say. I really think that's the intention of the poster. <laughs> and the reason I think that is because I have met people like that um, in my walk as a believer. And obviously I don't agree with that. I'm a married man. I've been married now almost 24 years. I have five children and three grandchildren. So I've got a little bit of experience under my belt in that regard. Happily married still. I have a wonderful, beautiful wife. I do have a Proverbs 31 woman, I, I do. And Yahweh has blessed me and made me great through her. And I'm thankful for her. Is my wife quiet? First thing on the poster was quiet. Here's the problem with just the word quiet being on the poster. This is one of those half-truths that I'm talking about. Is that when you put one word like that as a characteristic or a one-liner like that as a characteristic for a woman, there's more nuance, there's more detail that has to be said. It's kind of like people that quote one-liners out of the Bible, out of context. I'll give you a few of them. Acts 10, rise Peter, kill and eat. <laughs> Some of y'all know that one-liner. Paul writes, eat whatever's set before you, asking no question for conscience sake. Anybody ever had that one-liner given to them? The Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. Anybody ever heard that one? For somebody that tries to tell you you don't have to keep Sabbath. This is the problem with one-liners. People use them out of context and they begin to mean things that they never originally meant. Quiet can be taken as sit down and shut up, don't ever say anything. Do I believe that's what the Bible teaches? For instance, in 1 Peter 3 when it talks about the righteous woman has a meek and quiet spirit? No, I don't believe that's what quiet means. I don't believe quiet means that she never talks, that she never voices her opinion in a scriptural discussion, that she never disagrees with her husband, that when they're making decisions in their home and the husband wants to go in one direction, that if the woman sees that that direction is not going to be the best or the most prosperous for the family as a whole, that she just has to be quiet and not say anything to her husband, not say, 
well, honey, I think we should probably go in this direction, and here's why, and let's talk about it. I think all of those things are good things, and I do not think that that's what the word quiet means, that she should never voice her opinion or even disagree with her husband. Do I believe that a husband is the head of his wife? Yes. I think we learn that from Numbers chapter 30. And I think we learn that in the Newer Testament from Ephesians chapter 5. I do not believe, though, that that means a man is to take his big thumb and press down on his wife and never allow her to have a voice or never listen to anything that she has to say or think that she can't know anything about the Bible. So what we're learning here is that, just like I said, there's more nuance to the word quiet. What does, what does that mean? See. I would never hold up a poster that said a godly woman should be in one put quiet. I would never hold that up because there's way too much detail and context that goes along with that word in 1 Peter chapter 3. Another one is uh, silent in church. That was on the video. A woman must be silent in church. Now that is gathered from 1 Corinthians 14. 1 Corinthians 14, I think it's right around verses 34 through 35. Let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak. And then the 35 talks about if they have any questions, let them ask their husbands at home, for it's a shame for a woman to speak in the, in the assembly. Speak utterance. What does that mean? Now, you're naive if you think that there is not more than one understanding on 1 Corinthians 14, 34 through 35. That's just a naive position, and it's... Really, it's silly to say, well, the Bible is clear. Just believe what it says. That's silly on most things in Scripture because there's always context to what an author is writing. So, the silent church, does that mean that a woman can't sing in church? Now, if you take, it's a shame for a woman to bring forth utterance or speak, if you take that to its extreme, then you would have to believe that a woman cannot sing in church because all singing is doing is speaking to this melody or harmony. A lot of the songs that are sung, at least in our assembly, come right out of the scriptures. We sing the Shema. We sing the Psalms. We sing texts in the prophet Isaiah. When we say, Hear, O Israel, Yahweh is our mighty one. There is one Yahweh, Deuteronomy 6, verse 4, and a woman is singing that. She's speaking a, a scriptural truth, a commandment, the greatest commandment in the Torah. Is she not allowed to do that? Now, some people, because they get boxed in, might want to say, well, Brother Matthew, that's right. She shouldn't be singing. We need to sit down and shut the women up because they shouldn't be singing. A lot of people are going to do that because they, they're going to get upset at me um, for even bringing this up. And they're going to say, all right, we're going to be consistent. And it's just, it's just, you know, that it's not saying a woman can't sing in church. You know that. Come on. So we go from there and we talk about, let's say, a prayer request. Now, we often ask for a prayer request in our congregation and then we pray over them as a corporate body. Can a woman raise her hand and offer up a prayer request in church? Now somebody says, yeah, yeah, she can. That's not what silence means. Okay, can a woman give a testimony? She had an encounter this past week. She wants to share about the encounter that she had. She was going through a hard time during that day and then somebody bumped into her at the grocery store and it lifted her spirits. She became encouraged and she wants to testify about that. Is that okay? I don't think there's anything wrong with that for a woman to give a testimony in the church. So the point here is that to just put on a poster that a woman has to be silent in church, it lacks proper context. It's three words, even out of two contextual verses, which come out of a whole chapter, really three chapters, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14, there's way more context that needs to be unpacked in that particular text. This is the problem that I have with that poster. I believe that women should be keepers of the home. My wife often says, I'm the keeper of the home. Let me decorate how I want to decorate. 
and I tell her, you have the full range, no problem. Caretakers of children, obviously. Yes, I mean, a mother is a nurturer. Not that a father shouldn't be a caretaker of a child either. Not that a father or a husband can't keep the home in some sense as well. It's the same thing with modesty. A woman should dress modest, should act modest. Um, same thing with a man. A man should dress modest and act modest. So it's not that I had a complete problem with things on the list. It's that there's, there's a lot more nuance that needs to go um, on the list. Now, to a little bit bigger picture in regards to uh, Old Testament versus New Testament, which I don't believe there's a versus, but you'll see why I'm saying this in a second. What I think a lot of people do on this subject with women in ministry is they take two primary texts from the writings of Paul, 1 Timothy chapter 2 and 1 Corinthians chapter 14. 14 in 1 Corinthians is about let your women keep silence in the assemblies. 1 Timothy 2 is I do not allow a woman to teach or usurp authority over a man but to be in silence. So they take these two verses and those are their base texts and then they look at anything else the Bible has to say and they run it or filter it through those two verses and they try to make everything else fit with 1 Corinthians 14 and 1 Timothy 2. I think that's bad hermeneutics and I don't believe that we should start with the Newer Testament um, whether it be the writings of Paul or even the Gospel of Matthew. I think that we have to understand later revelation by previous revelation. Now this is a concept that a lot of people understand in the Torah community for instance, in Acts 17, 10 through 11, where the Bereans are praised. Uh, they're more noble than the Thessalonians because they received the word that Paul would preach to them with great eagerness. They were on the edge of their seat uh, receiving the word. And then they examined the scriptures daily to see if these things that Paul said was so. And obviously the only scriptures that would have existed back then would be what we call the Old Testament or the Tanakh, the Law, the Prophets, and the Writings. Could they get what Paul was telling them from the Law, the Prophets, and the Writings? And that's the key. And that's what I had to do. I used to take a more strict position on women preaching, women teaching, women in ministry, and I used to take the more uh, patriarchal or the, the stronger complementarian position um, and I no longer take that position however I, I didn't bounce all the way back to the strong egalitarian position either I think that there's a balance and in order for us to get a well-rounded view on this subject and in order for us to arrive at the truth we have to look at everything that the Bible has to say we can't just focus on one text one line and we have to begin in the law, the prophets, and the writings, and then branch out from there to the Newer Testament, the writings of Peter and Paul and other authors, uh, other epistles there in the Newer Testament. What I did is I asked myself, am I going to start with 1 Timothy 2, or am I going to start with Genesis 1 and 2? Am I going to start with 1 Corinthians 14, or am I going to look to approved examples in, let's say, the book of Judges or the book of First Chronicles? And I bring up Judges and Chronicles because there's two particular women that are mentioned in the Tanakh. And their names are Deborah and Huldah. And when you look at Deborah and Huldah, nothing negative is ever said about their ministry. Nothing negative is said about Deborah. It is never said that Deborah was a judge because the men weren't stepping up to the plate or Yahweh couldn't find a man for the job. If Yahweh wants a man to do a job, he'll raise one up. <laughs> it's as simple as that. Think about Jonah. Yahweh wanted Jonah to do this job of being a prophet to the Ninevites and he ran and Yahweh caught him and put him into the mouth of a great fish and the fish spewed him out on the land and he had to go prophesy to the Ninevites. So if Yahweh wants a man to do a job, he'll find one to do it. If you read Judges 4 through 5 and you read the whole book of Judges, 
you'll see that the judges were leaders in the community. They weren't just, you know, like Judge Judy. <laughs> that was part of their what they did, is that they judged cases. And you can look at uh, Judges chapter 4 in regards to Deborah and then compare it with Exodus 18 where Moses would sit and judge the people and teach them the commandments. That's what Deborah was doing in Judges chapter 4. She was not only a judge but a prophet. And people just didn't decide, I think I'll study to be a prophet. I think I'll go to school to be a prophet. <laughs> no, they were gifted by Yahweh. They were able to do things that normal lay people could not do because Yahweh had blessed them with that particular ministry and that particular gift. So not a single negative word is ever said about Deborah. And the same thing goes for Huldah in First Chronicles, and I can't think of the chapter right now, but it's when, under the reign of King Josiah, they found the book of the law, probably the book of Devarim, Deuteronomy. And when they brought it to the king and read it in the hearing of the king, he tore his clothes because he knew that the people of Israel had been rebellious and they were about to come un up, up under the judgment of Yahweh. King Josiah and the scribe, which if I'm not mistaken, his name was Shaphan, and then the high priest, which his name might have been Hilkiah, they go to the prophetess, prophet, the person who stands in the place of Elohim on the earth, and her, she, female, her name is Huldah. And Huldah relays the words of Yahweh to the king, the high priest, and the scribe. That is teaching. That is preaching to men. And they have to listen to what the prophetess says. So, am I going to read 1 Corinthians 14 and override the Tanakh? Am I going to read 1 Timothy 2 and override the Tanakh? Some people don't have a problem with doing that because some people think that, ah, that's just Old Testament. We don't go by that anymore. We just go by the New Testament. I, I'm sorry, but that number one, I don't think that's how Scripture should be studied and exegeted. And number two, if I did that, then I could just throw out anything that I read in the Old Testament and say, well, the New Testament supersedes. No, I have to read the New with my Old Testament glasses on and realize that moral standards that Yahweh has, things that He disallows or allows in the Older Testament, cannot be overturned in the Newer Testament. And so I read a text like 1 Timothy 2 and if I slow down and I read it, I see that it's talking about wives and husbands. I know the view that it's talking about the uh, cult of Artemis in the area of Ephesus and it's talking about the false women teachers and things like that. And I have a sermon on that which I've changed my view a little bit since I taught that sermon, but I have a sermon where I talked about that particular view, and I, I just, I, I don't think that that's a good exegesis of that. First Timothy 2 is talking about husbands and wives. Several translations of First Timothy 2, not just modern, but anciently, says uh, a woman should not uh, usurp authority over her husband, but be in silence. And it's even then, it's not talking about complete silence. But what it's referring to is that a wife should not take the position or domineer over the position that her husband has in the home. And we don't just get this from Ephesians 5, which says the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. We also get this from Genesis 1 and 2, where Adam was formed first or chief. Adam was created First, and then Eve was taken out of Adam. We get the order of headship in the creation right there. Before the fall, it's before the fall, so it's the order of headship in creation. And Adam and Eve were what? Husband and wife, bone of bone, flesh of flesh. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. Eve was Adam's wife. And we get it from Numbers chapter 30, which is a big one where it's talking about vows, how that a wife can make a vow in her home and when the husband hears that vow, he can overturn that. And, and it's showing his leadership role in, in the home. And same thing with a daughter. So 
in 1 Timothy 2, it even mentions Adam and Eve. Adam was formed first and then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. So when Adam sinned in the garden, he sinned willfully, he knew what he was doing, he was told by Yahweh what not to do, he did it anyhow, and Eve actually was deceived into what she did. And then it talks about childbearing later on in the text, and there's different understandings of that, but the point is, is that childbearing is a key word because it speaks of the relationship that a husband and wife have. So 1 Timothy 2 is talking about husbands have the leadership role in the home. It doesn't mean the woman's role is not valued or does not carry dignity or that she just has to sit down and shut up or that she can't have anything to share with her husband or with her family or that she can't be involved in making decisions with her husband. It doesn't mean any of that. It just means that she is supposed to recognize that her husband, he carries the role of the Messiah in the home. Not that he's perfect, not that he's flawless. A beautiful marriage is designed to show forth the relationship of the Messiah and the assembly. And the Messiah loved the assembly and gave himself for the assembly. The way he led was sacrificially. He laid down his life. And then the woman is supposed to show forth the assembly in that as the assembly submits to the authority or leadership of the Messiah, so the wife is to submit to her husband. Now obviously this doesn't mean that if a man asks his wife to commit a transgression of the law that she has to go along with that transgression. Obviously not because Yahweh and the commandments always comes first, whether we're talking about marriage relationships or people-to-government relationships. We submit to the extent that we do not have to violate uh, one of Yahweh's laws. Um, I do believe, however, that in a marriage, in a home, if we have two Torah-observant people, uh, a husband and wife, that I believe the wife should submit to the husband's understanding and practice of a commandment. If, even if she disagrees with it. So, in other words, there's little nuances. Y'all know, people in the Torah community know that there's different understandings and ways to um, interpret certain commandments in the Torah. And so the family needs to be in unity, and uh, the way that that is done is by, after the discussion has taken place, uh, that if the husband and wife still disagree, I believe that they need to go with the husband's understanding in practice. Not that they can't continue to talk about it, but he's the head of the home. So I think that's what 1 Timothy 2 is talking about. It's not talking about other categories. So, for instance, let's go back to Deborah in Judges 4. In Judges 4, Deborah is mentioned. Her husband Lapidoth is mentioned. She would fall under the submissive role to her husband in the home, Lapidoth, uh, but that does not mean that she couldn't carry this spiritual leadership role as a judge or a leader in Israel, okay, where she would sit and the people would come to her for judgment and she would teach the instructions of Yahweh. So she was able to balance her submissiveness in the home to Lapidoth while at the same time having the spiritual leadership role in the community. And then what about 1 Corinthians 14? 1 Corinthians 14, 34-35, let your women keep silence in the assemblies. Well, I've already talked about why I don't think it is talking about singing. I don't think it's talking about giving a testimony or giving a prayer request. I don't even think it's talking about reading the Torah. I call on certain women to read the Torah in our congregation. We take turns from men and women. I don't think there's any problem with that. I don't even think it's talking about a woman standing up and teaching a lesson to the congregation with both men and women in the congregation. I don't. And you know why? The Tanakh. The Tanakh is my foundation. So if Holda could tell the king, the high priest, and the scribe what to do, she's preaching now the words of Yahweh are coming from heaven down through her mouth, telling the, the men, the high men in Israel, what to do, then I have no problem with a woman teaching a lesson in a congregation. That does not mean that she carries the office of the pastorate or the overseer in the congregation. I do think that Exodus and also in 1 Timothy, I think that we would see the teaching there meaning that the office of overseer or uh, what we would call pastor or shepherd is uh, 
regulated there to uh, the male gender. Um, Paul even talks about this in 1 Timothy 3, I think 4 through 5, where he says that a man first has to show himself able to rule a home. Because if he can't rule his home, how can he rule or lead the church, lead the assembly? This doesn't mean that women can't be a pastor because they're not smart <laughs> or they're not gifted. I think that there's just this overseeing and leadership the Bible as a whole would show with a multitude of examples that this position is uh, for men. That being said, you know, I'm a pastor at the congregation. I could sit down and listen to a woman teach a lesson and I could learn from it. It doesn't mean she's the pastor. See? So, why do you take this position, Brother Matthew? Well, it's because I believe in being balanced. I see too many extremes. I have to look at what all of the Scripture says. If I only centered in on a few New Testament verses, I could teach you that you don't have to keep the dietary laws. If I only centered in on a few New Testament verses, I could teach you that it's okay to break the Sabbath and the Sabbath is not that big of a deal. But when we read the whole Bible from cover to cover, when we take everything into consideration, then we have to start piecing verses together, harmonizing concepts, making sure we're not swinging too far to the right or too far to the left, and in the end coming to what the sum, S-U-M, of the Word of Yahweh teaches on a subject. It's very important that we do this. I hope that you can kind of piece all of those thoughts together. I'm speaking from my heart. I'm not going to camp out on two New Testament texts and ignore everything else the Bible has to say. And I've just covered the tip of the iceberg in this video here. There's a, a lot more, but I'm going to add this video to my Strong Women in Scripture series. It's based on Proverbs 31:17, And I do have some more uh, messages to teach. Let me say this as I close. I think the problem that a lot of women, not all women, I think I do think some women have a modern day, modern culture, women empowerment vibe about them that is not scriptural, uh, where they try to elevate themselves above men in marriage or try to take the role, the masculine role. And obviously I don't agree with that. Um, I don't expect the culture to follow the scriptures. I don't get mad when I see a woman of the world with that mentality or idea because that's what I expect if she or he doesn't follow scripture. See? But I think a lot of women in the Torah community get upset when they see a poster like this. Not because nothing on the poster is true, but because they see a lopsidedness in teaching from a lot of men. You see this in modesty. Anytime modesty is brought up, it's always directed towards the woman. I have been to churches where women were very modestly dressed and then the men would have on a you know, tight pants, tucked in shirt with the, the back of the pants is caressing everything. And it's just not, it's not appropriate. It's not appropriate. In Genesis 3, Yahweh clothed both Adam and Eve with tunics and, uh, for modesty. And I don't see anywhere where that's changed in the Bible. It's not that women are upset for listening or hearing that they need to be modestly dressed. It's that why do we never hear this from men? And I think it's the same thing in regards to this whole women in ministry thing. I think a lot of men have problems with misogyny where they can't learn anything from a woman. They feel like if they give their wife a little bit of rope or women a little bit of rope that they're going to lose their control. They're going to lose their power. And I think it's because a lot of men are power hungry. That's not how we're taught to lead in the Bible anyhow. The best example we could have is Yeshua. And Yeshua was gentle. Matthew 11, 28 through 30, he says, Come to me, learn from me. He doesn't say learn of me in that text. He's not talking about learning about him. He's talking about learning from me. 
When you come to be taught by the Messiah, the way he teaches is gentle and lowly of heart. You'll find rest because he's not going to use the Torah to try to nail you down to the board. He's going to have mercy. Um, as the prophet Hosea says, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. Uh, he's going to be very tender and gentle in the way that he teaches. Any man that has to demand submission from his wife is a weak man. If you've got to preach at your wife to be submissive and she's kicking against the goads, something's wrong. Men, you should be living and acting in a way towards your wife and your family that they want and desire to submit to your leadership in the home because you're such a great husband or a great father. It's no different than you know a boss that leads a business. Leadership is not about barking orders. It's about getting down and showing the employees, this is how we do it. We're in this together. A good leader serves. The Messiah served, washed his disciples' feet. And that's what us men are supposed to do. So it's not about power struggles or being power hungry. The, the heathens do like that, but it's not like that with us. The greatest shall be the one who serves.